this new interpretation for the derivative that we have in terms of first order variation, this is not too weird. It is in fact totally consistent with everything that you knew about the derivative before. Consider, for example, our interpretation of the derivative as the slope of the tangent line of a graph. So draw the graph of a function, pick some input. You want to know how does the output change when you change the input? Well, to first order, that coefficient is the derivative. You change the input by a certain amount, the output to first order changes by the derivative times that change in the input. Now that change in output divided by the change in input, that is a slope. The slope of the tangent line in the limit. In fact, thinking of derivatives as rates of change is an extremely important interpretation of the derivative. Let's remember how that works based on a slight variation of the definition. Recall one way to define the derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at x equals a is as the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. Now that's the same as the original definition that we did using h equals x minus a and letting h go to zero. But in this form, the derivative is the limit of the change in output per unit change in input as that ladder goes to zero. Now this definition is very much worth knowing and it is very consistent with our asymptotic perspective in terms of Taylor expansion. Consider what happens when you Taylor expand f of x about a. You get f of x equals f of a plus the derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at a times quantity x minus a. And then, oh, I'm thinking way back to what we did with Taylor series. We got a one over two factorial and the second derivative and blah, blah, blah. I'm just gonna put all of that in a trash can, in a big O of quantity x minus a squared, because all the other terms in the Taylor expansion are higher order. Now, watch what we do. We're going to rearrange the terms a little bit, moving over to the left, the derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at a times x minus a, that is equal to f of x minus f of a minus big O of x minus a squared. Now minus big O plus big O, that doesn't matter, it's just a constant. So what are we gonna do to get the derivative by itself? I need to divide both sides of this equation by quantity x minus a. Doing so gives me the derivative of f with respect to x at x equals a equals f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a plus big O of what? Well, I had x minus a squared. I divide by x minus a. That gives me big O of x minus a. And now, if you take the limit as x goes to a, that big O term, that's going to zero. And what you get is the definition of the derivative that we have stated here in the limit as x goes to a. Now this form of the derivative, this limit of change in output divided by change in input is in fact the reason for the notation df dx. It's kind of like a infinitesimal change in the output divided by an infinitesimal change in the input. Speaking of notation, that's probably something we should pay a little more attention to. If you're talking about the derivative of a function with respect to an input, the absolute best notation to use is something like df dx. Or if you want to be explicit about where the derivative is being evaluated, df dx evaluated at x equals a. What's nice about this is you know exactly what the output is, you know exactly what the input is, everything is explicit. And you really do want to be explicit with your inputs now 
You'll thank me later when you do multivariable calculus and you got functions with all kinds of inputs and outputs. There's no room for ambiguity in variables in the future. Now there's other notation that you can use for derivatives that I have occasionally indulged in. You might see me sometimes use f prime to denote the derivative. If you're working with, especially, something that changes with respect to time, you might see the notation f dot. Or sometimes I might use differential notation df to denote the derivative of f. You got to be careful with some of these notations. This can sometimes be used. It is convenient, but you can get in trouble not knowing what you're taking the derivative with respect to. So be careful about that notation. But avoid, never, ever get creative with notation that does sort of scripty things with your D's or uses Greek letters for your D's or uses, oh my gosh, capital D's. Don't ever do that. No, 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 no. Because these alternate symbols do mean something. And mathematics is a large and strange country. Do not use symbols, the meanings of which you do not entirely comprehend. Which brings me to a little bit of hypocrisy because I have used differentials. You have used differentials. It's sometimes helpful to use these, especially when you don't want to exactly specify what you're changing with respect to an input but you have to be really careful with these. Differentials can be abused, especially since you don't exactly know what they mean. They are an occasional convenience. But behold, I show you a mystery. In all that you've seen of calculus past, you've used differentials. You've talked about things like dx, but it's always been left unanswered. What exactly is it? Is it a tiny change? Is it a rate of change? Well, it's complicated. And it's a secret that I cannot yet reveal to you, but will tell you someday in the far, far future. For now, we'll use it from time to time and say more about it later.